Tom Vanderbilt, let's. Well, I want to dive right into begin, uh, beginners. By the way, does everybody ask you? This is a money podcast. Retire sooner. Our mission here to help a million people retire one, at least one year early. A uh, million years of newfound economic freedom. That's a huge theme. Uh, another huge theme here is money and happiness. And what are the traits of the happy retirees versus unhappy? My my book coming out this fall is what the happiest retirees know. 10 habits essentially of the happiest retirees in America. But I'm going to start by saying, since it's a, a money oriented investing podcast is, can you tell me about the Vanderbilt name? Were, were you born in a mansion <laughs> or were you just a distant, distant cousin? <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me if, if this book had allowed me to actually retire already, but um, but no, it, it hasn't done that. But um, it, it's a great question. And in fact, we recently moved to Madison, New Jersey, which is near a place called Florham Park, which has a school called Fairleigh Dickinson University. And a lot of those buildings used to belong to one of the actual Vanderbilts. Um, and there's, there's a Vanderbilt Drive. There's a sports bar not that far away called Vanderbilts. Anyway, those were the real Vanderbilts. I am not related to them as far as I've been able to figure out. So I, I make my money the old-fashioned way. I, I earn it, as they used to say. So, um, the old, well, I think the Vander, remember the Vanderbilts, uh, there were no millionaires left, I think, by like the, the mid-1970s. Uh, something, something like most of the family, because the wealth got spread out so much, or some statistic, some cautionary tale. Supposedly, yeah, and there's no like big foundation the way there is the Carnegie or uh, Rockefeller. Uh, there's not much of it. I mean, Anderson Cooper, of course, is a you know, is part of that clan. Yeah, you know, see, Gloria. he's working. Uh, he actually yeah. still has to work. <laughs> exactly. So don't feel bad. Even if you were a true Vanderbilt, you would still have to work. Is what I'm saying. Um, the <laughs> now, wait, how many? Don't you? You have some kids. How many? How many kids do you have? Uh, just one. And just one. Okay. My, well, yeah. Main How research old? subject for this book. Uh, she's now tw- just turned twelve. So um. okay. Well, when she when you apply her to like a fancy private school, I mean, boom, Vanderbilt name at least, right? <laughs> for sure. Well, <laughs> unless they ask, we'll just yeah. let them you know, keep keep it in suspense. <laughs> uh. Well, but so so let's that brings me to kind of your your daughter and her kind of inquisitiveness on insatiable appetite to just learn, learn, learn new, new, new. And I, it sounds like that's the genesis, but the thought of this concept of, you know, of beginners and well, where did it begin? Yeah, it was definitely my daughter. It wasn't something that I cooked up ahead of time. She, it was a weird story. We were in a library and we were playing this game of checkers, got a little games area and she saw right next door and she was uh, four at the time. She saw a chessboard, um, and she said, "Can we play that? That looks really interesting." And I said, "Well, I'd love to, but I actually don't know how. I never really learned how to play." So uh, this kind of set me into a little bit of a you know crisis of confidence. You don't want to be a, a dad telling your daughter you don't know how to do something. So I tried to learn. I found it really challenging. wasn't doing that well on my own. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to just suck it up here, and I, I want, I'm going to hire a coach. And I know that sounds ridiculous to hire. A coach for you know a four-year-old uh, to learn chess, but I thought, <laughs> you know, I thought we'd get the biggest bang for our buck. And when I say we, I quickly decided, well, if she's going to try this, you know, why don't I join in on these sessions? And I asked the instructor if that was okay. Said it's a little strange, uh, you know, fifty near near fifty-year-old and this four-year-old learning something at the same time <laughs> as beginners. Uh, but he thought it was great, and so we were both. You know, it was like a, it was a experiment in a way that I was running, and it was a sample size of two. You know, this four year old and then me, and I was kind of curious. You know, how would this how would this play out? You know, would she learn it right away? Would I struggle? Um, you know, we each kind of came to the game with our our own strengths and weaknesses that kind of have to do with age and some other stuff. But at the end of the day, I, w- I was so you know intrigued by this whole process, and I, I kind of loved learning this this new thing. We opened this whole new world. Chess is a huge world. I'm talking like before Queen's Gambit, you know, which is mm-hmm. the game has become kind of newly popular again. But um, I, I just so, you know, I, I was so struck. I thought, what, like, what are what are some other things I've always wanted to do or never been able to do that I would really like to take a crack at? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, wait, so how did it go? <laughs> but by the way, how did it go? Were you good right away? Did Were you not so good? Did your daughter get better quicker? Like what, fast forward to today. That was eight years ago. Yeah, I mean, there, there's two two main things to think about. I mean, there's the age factor. So kids, you know, really are sponges when it comes to learning. And one of the reasons are their their brains, you know, to put it simply, are sort of emptier than adults. You know, if I'm if I'm trying to learn something, I've got 
nearly five decades of, of memories, of data, of other things I've learned, of muscle memory, you know, getting in the way. My daughter barely knew anything at that age. So for her, chess was something that all these you know, neurons that are forming in her brain could just gobble up. So um, another thing to think about there is the speed of one's brain. You know, adults have this, um, sorry, kids, kids have what's known as fluid intelligence. They're really good at rapid uh, problem solving, pattern recognition. So my daughter was really great at things like uh, solving puzzles in chess, which is a lot of what chess is about, and playing blitz chess, which is like speed chess. Oh, I, was sort I remember of that from Queen's Gambit. I remember the, the speed chess from the, that, uh, the Netflix show, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sort of better at kind of like the long term strategy a little bit patience. I've played a lot of games. I sort of know how to how to how to how to win a little bit, you know, kind of that mm -hmm. that street, those street smarts, if you will. But um, the other thing is that, you know, lifestyle. She was playing a lot of chess. She was she was taking more lessons than me because I, I you know, work would come up. I wouldn't be able to go to the lesson. And she was doing a lot of tournaments, a lot of scholastic tournaments. And then she'd have to analyze those games with her instructor. She was doing what they call deliberate practice, where you do something, you get something wrong, you, you try to figure out why you got it wrong with a coach or, or your own self. I was sort of playing a lot of games online, just trying to win. And if I lost, I'd get frustrated and play again. And that's not really the best way to actually get better at something. So end of the day, she is better than I am, I, you know, I might be able to beat her once in a while, but, and I, and I still quite play quite a bit, but she definitely has some inherent strengths, I think. But so it, tw so what, at what age did she start to pass you in chess? Probably about, you know, a year afterwards. So let's say five, which sounds, <laughs> sounds ridiculous, but so I, I say this, but there's, so I cool say this, think. yeah, I mean, there's something in the news right now, this kid, uh, a homeless he was homeless. Uh, his parents were from Nigeria. He's in the New York City area. Is on track to become the world's youngest grandmaster, which you need a rating of twenty four hundred. My rating is like something like a thousand. He's he's Ooh. ten. So it, chess yeah. is just one of those weird things where kids can be, you know, as good at, if not much better than than adults. But um, but to get back to that that age question, so I, you know, uh, my whole point was, you know, with this book was, you know, to try to get into these things I've always wanted to learn. Uh, singing, drawing, surfing. Um, and, you know, these are hardly like, you know, strange things. These are things that are on a lot of people's lists. I mean, when I, if you type in how to learn into Google, uh, how to learn drawing is one of the, the first things that actually comes up. So these are kind of like things a lot of people would like to be able to take a crack at, but they never get around to doing either because they, they you know, they don't have time. They think they're not good. They think they don't have time to become good. And so really what my book in the end of the day, I was trying to come up with what I felt was a manifesto that, you know, to say none of those things are true, that, you know, you can find the time, you can get better. You might not, you know, become amazing, but the possibility is there. But we, to some extent, we, I guess, do we give up? And as I was thinking through what we were going to talk about, I was thinking, it seems like adults would give up maybe a lot, maybe easier than kids. I don't know. I'll ask you that. Number one, number two, do we, by the time we're 40 or 50, do we not try new things because we kind of has tried, we've tried some iteration of a lot of things and we learn like, for instance, surfing, it's like, well, maybe you tried skateboarding and your balance was not all that good. And you're like, oh, I'm not going to be good at surfing either. So I'm not going to try. Do we have our own biases that are like, wow, well, I'm too old to, I, I've tried to, you know, maybe you tried to an instrument as a kid and you weren't all that good. So you're like, oh, I'm 50. I'm not going to try this now? Like, why, why are we afraid? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we have not only our own internal biases, but there, there's cultural social biases as well. I mean, we think it's sort of okay for a four-year-old to take a vocal lesson or a chess lesson, but we might think it's strange if a 60 or 70-year-old did. Like, because we, you know, we think, well, yeah. how good can you get at your age? Whereas this other kid is sort of this untapped uh, progress. But yeah, I mean, the, the problem is, you know, adults, we, we hit something like middle age, and we're used to being good at things. You know, we've, we've built up our whole lives on trying to be good at things in, in our career. You know, you, on LinkedIn, people are, are touting their accomplishments, you know, for good reason. We don't, we don't necessarily like list the things we're not, we're not good at. Um, so it's, it's a very hard thing for an adult to leave that zone of competence and return really to what is a childlike existence of, of not knowing, of making mistakes, of, of you know, be, being unaware. And the, the thing that we give up 
when we're no longer children is precisely that unencumbered sense of being able to learn anything, being able to learn without pressure. Uh, you know, when I let my daughter start to learn chess, I didn't say you, you have to be a grandmaster by age 10. I just said, let's see where it goes. And, you know, she was just having fun with it. Uh, you know, adults, a lot of things, you know, a lot of the instructors I talked to, the coaches said, you know, one of the problems with adult beginners is they come in with this really strong set of, of goals. And especially, especially men, they, they said, you know, I'm going to crush this thing in six months and then move on to the next thing. And often <laughs> that's a very counterproductive strategy because the thing will crush you. It hurts your self-esteem. You, you know, if you, you, you miss this one little thing, it sets you back weeks. Uh, you know, people then their people's real lives intervene. It's hard to make the practice schedule. So there, there's there's a lot of a lot of things going on. But I think the the mental, uh, you know, voice inside our heads there telling us we, we, we can't get good is a, is a, a larger actual thing than the physical inability to get good at something like surfing. So how do, so I want our our listeners uh, because I, I think of. You know, one of the things I one of one of the research studies that I did, and I wrote a book about this seven or eight years ago, uh, had to do is it it's called "You Can Retire Sooner Than You Think." And one of the non-money side pieces of that was something called core pursuits, and the happy retirees had a certain amount more than the unhappy group, three point six versus one point nine. And I and I think about sometimes the dichotomy of a retire someone who does stop working and i and i'm thinking of somebody who's let's call them 60 up 55 plus and they for so i want them to get out of this maybe your take and you're giving them permission to say no, no no it's not crazy to go because i think the singing is a great example when you're 55 and if you've never really been in a band or you've sung or done it to start singing seems almost like crazy or silly it's it's almost easier to say i'm going to start chess or i'm going to juggle but like at 55 are you going to go learn to surf are you going to go to learn to sing and you say why not yeah i mean a lot of people might think, you know, again, you're, you're at the peak of your career, maybe nearing retirement. You're, you're trying to, you know, work on all these these job things. Why get into something seemingly trivial like a hobby? Um, I mean, there's a couple a couple of reasons there. I mean, one is that there's some very, very fascinating research that uh, David Epstein, in his great book Range, also talks about this. Um, that they looked at Nobel Prize winning scientists. The scientists that have w actually won the Nobel Prize seem to partake in more uh, hobbies like like amateur uh, acting, singing, dancing, art, art, you name it, than the the scientists who hadn't won the Nobel. So there, you know, it, 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 there's a couple of things we could draw from that. You know, you know, maybe maybe those people were just sort of more creative to begin with. They had you know more wide ranging minds, or maybe something that they saw or learned or did in that side pursuit actually came back to their own life and gave them some new insight in, into their their science. Uh, but you know, this this great guy, I. I met and wrote a piece about named Jesse Itzler, who um, he runs a thing called 29029, by the way, which is a, uh, you, you climb Mount Everest level elevation, but on a ski slope in the summer. So you go yeah. up, you go down, you go up. So I, so I, I did that. But anyway, but Jesse has this whole spiel, uh, he calls it the life resume. You know, we, we get so obsessed with this, this sort of job resume, like what, here's your strengths, blah, blah, blah. But what, what's on that life resume, all the stuff outside of your job, you know, that, that make you this sort of balanced whole person. And one thing that happened during the, the pandemic, I think, is that some of these hobbies and pursuits for people who had them became, and, and this is talked about in some, you know, uh, mental health research, became a sort of, you know, form of resilience against this interruption of, of normal life. Like they had these other things they could sort of fall back on. And I think, you know, retirement might be the same way where, you know, suddenly your normal life is disrupted. Your, all your habits that you used to know are gone. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah. If you have all if you if you have all these things that you've been sort of cultivating since maybe your whole life, maybe it's just your 50, 60, it, it's something to fall back on. You know, so you, you have this whole you, you know the, the pursuits I was doing, I, I sort of I, I tend to think of them as like little gardens that I was growing. And you mm -hmm. know, some weeks some weeks I wouldn't water the surfing garden at all. It would take me a month to go surfing again. But but I, I was working on there, they're sort of growing and you know, maybe down the road when when I hit that retirement age. These will be things that I'm still interested in, and I can sort of, you know, point. And now I actually have the time to do them. Now, were you? So I want to ask about the the kind of the deep bench of the people that you talk to. So coaches and neuroscientists uh, and uh, experts and and so forth. But 
<clears throat> the thought of singing, juggling, chess, uh, surfing, and um, drawing, let's say those five things, were those the five things that just that you're like, look, these are all things I hadn't really done a lot of as a kid or growing up, and now I'm going to do them as an adult. Were those your five, or was there a whole giant list of 30 other things? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I started with a giant list, and, I, and then I started asking people, what, what would you do if you wanted to, you know, what would be a fun new thing to learn? What would be an interesting thing to learn? And people suggested all sorts of interesting things like, you know, improv theater, which, you know, even something like that, you know, it seems, seems strange, but that could probably help. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it would help with something like public speaking skills, you know, being able to yeah. think on the fly. Um, a friend of mine did this wonderful uh, gelato university course in Italy where you become a master gelato maker. I mean, just the tasting process there would be would be worth it. But um, <laughs> but but yeah, I was trying to make I was trying to not make the list too exotic. You know, I wanted it to be things that and almost anyone could learn almost anywhere. And with, possibly with the exception of surfing, if you're not near the ocean, but uh, all these things, surfing, drawing, I mean, they can cost money, but they're in this day and age, the internet is such a wonderful resource that for singing, for example, go on YouTube and type in singing lessons. There are a lot of vocal coaches working online. You can look at their stuff for free. You can hire mm. people in other, other cities, other countries that are sort of cheaper. Um, it, it's just a great time to, uh, you know, to, to learn things, but, but yeah, so by I, I way, sort of got that. By, yeah. by the way, uh, asking for a friend, can you get good at singing or don't, I always thought you kind of have to be good to begin with. Like, you're either born with it or not. That seems like one of those that's a little more just your genes or not necessarily. Yeah, I think this is one of the great myths that, that keeps people away. And you know, you'll you'll hear something commonly. My mother in law says this, for example, I'm I'm tone deaf. I can't carry a note. And there's something called cognitive amusia, which is tone deafness, that only, you know, this percentage a very small percentage of people actually have. Most people yeah. are just using that as an excuse because frankly, singing in public is is sort of terrifying this is a there's a great experiment where, where researchers were trying to understand what causes people to be embarrassed how embarrassment works so they thought what how can we make people embarrassed they, they had them sing so that you know singing is hard but yeah. in some ways in some ways <laughs> but this is because we've sort of made it hard as a society we you know we used to sing a lot more in our homes and, st and then mass media came along uh you know singing went from a participatory thing to something we started consuming you know, why sing in your home when you could turn on the radio and hear, you know, Enrico Caruso or Elvis Presley or whoever. <laughs> uh, so we're sort of culturally out of practice with singing. And, the, you know, one of my main takeaways from this book is that anyone can get better. You know, the sound of your voice is something you're, you're born with. You can change a little bit. But in, in terms of just being able to functionally sing, like hitting notes and that, yeah. it is, it's like a motor skill. It's like, that would be like saying, you know, you were born to serve a tennis ball. I mean, no one really, no one really says that. You, you could, you know, it's it's a skill that you have to work on. You have to practice. You can get better. Wow. So the and I guess this goes back to your point of almost this cult of performance and and social media. We we celebrate just the very pinnacle of the world, and we always have to some extent, but we always celebrate the best. But today we're almost even more hyper exposed that's on turbo charge like american idol it's like boom there's this one amazing singer that wins and in golf you know there's 10 million golfers in america and like five of them are amazingly good and make money right it's 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 a very pinnacle so is that part of what stops people too I think so. And there's this magic number that's out there that the 10,000 hours rule, which, you know, comes from the work of a psychologist named Anders Ericsson, who found that that was the amount of time spent in, in deliberate practice, not just practice, deliberate practice, you know, really focused, mindful practice that you needed to become an expert level performer. But the key word there is expert level. I mean, expert. that's to have it be your job. Uh, I, you know, my whole point was that after 10 hours or maybe 100 hours for sure, you could really go, you know, pretty far in a pursuit like juggling or singing or drawing. I mean, I spent, um, I'm trying to think of the drawing course I did. It was uh, about six hours a day, 30 hours. And by the end of that. Oh, so you did you well, like one, once a week or once every couple of weeks or do you one solid week? Well, I did a couple different things, but the first one was, it was a five day seminar. It was an intensive seminar with a guy whose uh, mother wrote a very famous book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And if you saw my my own self-portrait on day one, hour one, versus that same self-portrait 
at the end of day five, you know, you you and me would be amazed because the the, the amount of, of transformation that happened. I don't consider myself a an artistic person necessarily or and you know part of yeah. what the instructor was doing was demystifying. He said, you know, I'm not going to teach you how to be an artist. I don't I don't know how to do that, but I'm gonna teach you how to see the world. And I think that's one of the the little secrets about drawing is we don't we don't really know how to look at the world in the right way to to put it down onto paper and it, it, for all sorts of complicated reasons but yeah. the point is is that the point is is that you you can learn to draw it's it's a, another motor skill like like tennis or golf I mean, you might how not be da vinci <laughs> Sorry. yeah how about juggling by the way did you learn that i did you know i and this you know speaks to something about you know just how far you're going to go in something and i i learned three ball juggling, I learned four ball juggling, I learned a lot of tricks within that that discipline, but I'm still stuck at five ball, which is sort of like the benchmark for really expert juggling. And it's very mm. hard. I mean, mm. some of the, you know, I've been told it, it takes a year of really consistent practice to be able to do that. You know, there might be some other people that could do it much sooner. But, um, but the thing is, you know, I was just at a a, a work retreat sort of thing, and uh, that there were these. There was a, a stretching class, and they had these these balls. I said, "Oh, those look like good juggling balls." And the person uh, was like, "Oh, I wish I knew how to juggle." Does anyone here know how to juggle? I said, "Actually, I do." And I, and I was the only. I was the only one that raised my hand. And this is this is sort of a funny thing about about learning a skill is that it doesn't take you that long to learn how to juggle three balls. But that already. How puts long did you... that take, by the way? Because I I remember it looks. It's one of these things where. It kind of when you when, when you watch somebody do just the three ball juggling, it looks really easy because because you're good at it, and you make it look easy, and then you try it, and I'm like, well, I can't do it right away, so I'm like, ah, it's impossible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how it, long did it, it took, take you? A couple of days, uh, and then you know, but then here's what happens with skill learning. You know, you think you've got something nailed, suddenly all of a sudden you can't do it. I mean, skill skill learning doesn't always happen on this upward, you know, nice progress, uh, linear progress curve. You you have these sort of setbacks, and you know the what's going on there is complicated. But you know the brain might be sort of consolidating the memories of how you did it. You might be working out some problems, but um, but you have the, you have these setbacks, and that's part of the 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 you know the tenaciousness you need to to move forward is to just get over that. And what my juggling instructor told me is like. You know, change up your practice. Like, go to a different room, use different objects, uh, walk while you're juggling. Because you know, people to learn a skill, you kind of have to learn it in a lot of different conditions. You can't just learn it in one sort of artificially like nice condition because that won't work in the real world. Uh, but again, but yeah, you know, so I, yeah, I have this like superpower now, especially at kids' parties and things. But it it didn't take that long. But the the point is, is like not that many people actually know how to juggle because they maybe yeah. because they think it's it's really hard. But once you learn even a little bit, it gives you just that nice little, I don't want to say edge to be competitive about it, but it's just, it's just sort of a thing that you can, you know, that you have that you didn't have before and yeah. really isn't that hard. And I feel like with all these things, if you just invest a little bit of time, not 10,000 hours, you, you can actually be surprised by the progress you can make. Which goes back to the thought of just getting a little bit of expertise. And, you, you know, I think you're right. We're in a day and age where, YouTube is truly a magical place for learning. And I think about, you know, music in my family. I think about, uh, I was actually talking to my son, who's a guitar player. He's 14, but he's, he's learned. It's just kind of mind blowing how good he's gotten pretty much through YouTube. He does lessons as well, but the, the learning curve of saying, I'd love to play that song. And then to say, just to, to go to YouTube and find a, literally a lesson for, any level song for almost anyone that you ever hear is something that we didn't have as kids. And my dad played guitar. I just remember like his trajectory is through the roof because of the available learning. You went to this infant action lab or tell, tell us about, I it sounds like you went back in trying to figure out how to learn, uh, kind of learn like a kid. Yeah, because you know we we were all kids, we were all infants. We all came into the world really not knowing much of anything. You know how how to talk, how to get around, and so Infant Action Lab at NYU is this place where they study how infants learn to 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 move, to basically to crawl, then to walk, and so they they you know <laughs> imagine sort of a a daycare center with cameras and and people with clipboards, you know, watching babies crawl around and, and do stuff, huh. you know, which sound, which sounds kind of funny, but. But infants are, are are very funny. I mean, one one of the, the main things to take away is that they they fail. They fail a lot. I mean, infants fall 
upwards oh, constantly. Of what, 70 times an hour it's been it's been recorded and they also they walk a lot i mean that i wrote a piece for the wall street journal quoting this figure of two football fields an hour and the, the fact checker said no that that can't be right you have to go back and find out you know what the real figure is so i went back to the researcher and she assured me peer-reviewed research it's on camera that you know that's how much they can walk not not all day but they just have these intensive you know bouts they call it of of walking so but you know, infants learn in this great low pressure environment. They have a supportive audience of their parents and no one's expecting them to hit any goal or benchmark, they're just exploring. And I always thought, you know, so they do these experiments in this room where they'll have like the mother on one side of the room and the infant in the other, and, and then they let, they let the kid go and you think they would walk toward their mother, but they, they actually don't. They just want to explore and they have no purpose, no goal. <laughs> they're, just, they're just exploring because they want to learn and they want to, I mean, one of the reasons they actually want to walk is because that helps them learn. You, you, you're able to go more places, interact with more people, see more stuff. Um, so that, that I, I was trying to, you know, understand what makes kids such, I mean, to learn to walk in, in 18 months or, or 16 or however long it takes, you know, is, is pretty amazing given that you were, you could, you couldn't even sit up when you were born. Um, and you, at this point, we, we all have that 10,000 hours of walking. We are all expert walkers. So we can't really remember what it was like to be a beginner walker. And that kind of gets back to this whole point from before is that we've, we've forgotten as adults, for the most part, what it is to be a beginner. And that, and that when we encounter it, it can be kind of unnerving and, and disturbing because it, it just feels, you feel helpless and who wants to feel helpless? But. But, but so your message though to readers of beginners is that we have to just expect that it, it just, hey, remember that it took a lot of time. Remember that the infant was walking two football fields an hour to practice walking. Like, I love the thought of being yeah. an expert walker now. Like, we're yeah. experts <laughs> in walking. We're experts at talk. You know, it's funny. Um, what about this handbook for the clueless? And, and I know that's part of how you refer to your research. Uh, by the way, how, how many years did it take for all of this before you put it into a book? Uh, it was uh, about three three or four, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of that was the, sort of the research, the science research, but then a lot of it was just doing the stuff and trying to get better at the stuff, which does take a, a long time. I, I, don't, I wasn't trying to create a book where I could teach you some secret to become a, a great singer in one week, because I, I, you know, I just don't think that's actually possible. But um, I wanted, you know, I could teach you how to become an okay singer in maybe a month or, you know, it depends how much you work. But um, I mean, I guess, you know, it was part, part of what I was doing, though, you know, is trying to give people a guide, a guide that wasn't about how to crack this stuff right away, but a guide for the real world of how long it's going to take you and how you're going to suffer and how you're going to suffer, but how that's, how even that's going to feel good because you'll make them a lot of mistakes, but then the little bit of progress you make feels so intoxicating. And this is one of the, the great things about being a beginner. And in fact, makes it kind of an addicting process is that, you know, what people talk about the steep learning curve, and this is a funny thing that people often get wrong. They think that means something's really difficult. But what that actually means is, you know, if you, ha if you have an X, Y axis and there's X is progress and Y is time, a steep mm -hmm. learning curve means you're making a lot of progress in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And that feels, that feels great. I mean, you, you know, if you learn to ski or snowboard, like generally the first day you'll sort of get up on the skis or snowboard and maybe go down a small hill. Like that's a huge accomplishment from not skiing or snowboarding. Yeah. It's going to get a lot harder after that, and the progress is going to become less steep. You're, you're, it's going to mm. be this long. It's going to be this long plateau, where you're going to. It's you know that the first bit is the easiest, and that's what, again, I think awakens this this jolt. It, it, it didn't me, and I, I just felt you know sort of great the first time I got up on a surfboard or um, hit a certain note that I was trying to get. I mean that, which you yeah. know. Oh, sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, no, it's it's funny. You, I think you said elation, and I would I would concur that a new skill almost can bring or does bring almost the, it's it's a it's an elation. You're like this is so great. I remember I had a maybe you would uh, you could um, relate to this and some of the the people quitting, but I remember in high school going snowboarding, and I lived in. Pennsylvania. So we'd go to like this place called Camelback Mountain once in a blue moon. And it was a really big deal. My parents didn't, didn't ever want me to go. So I remember going to like friends, they drive up 
snowboard and then come back home. And I think it, the first day I did it, it was really, really hard. And I felt a hundred times and then the snowboard bindings broke out. And then the second time I went, I started to do it and I kind of got it. And then the bindings broke and it just was always like all never was amazing, but I learned to kind of do it. And then I went off to college in the South and there were no mountains. and I never went anywhere. And then, so to me in my brain, it wasn't that great. And then when I was like 40, two or 43, I went snowboarding for like a full three day period of time, which I'd never, and it was on a real mountain. You could actually learn because it was out West and it was, you know, 10 camelback mountains in one. And after the first day, I, I I actually got really got it and started to really enjoy it. And after the first three days, after three more days, I was like, this might be the most fun thing I've ever done in my entire life. I'm going to do this as long as, as I can, my knees hold up because it, to me sure. now, I will tell you, it's like the most fun thing I, I can even think of. Now tell, tell me about, so it was, I was like elated. I was like, I love this. Tell me about surfing by the way, cause it seems impossible. Yeah. Well, I was just going to echo what you're saying is, you know, I think sometimes, you know, the, the old cliche that youth is wasted on the young and that, you know, I was, as a youth, I was sort of a chronic underachiever and there, there were a lot of things I did not try. And maybe that explains my, my current zeal to try to try to catch up and, and think like what, yeah. what what was i what was i thinking and i think it really doesn't matter when you learn these things you know whether you're six or 60 you know just the fact that you're doing it is great but um surfing yeah i mean surfing surfing is amazing it's um it's very it's very difficult it's one of the hardest sports i think out there which is why you know that you the people who are really good at it you found that they tended to grow up in a place like california or hawaii and they were doing it when they were <laughs> this four-year-old grom in the water uh, because, you know, unlike skiing, say the mountain, the mountain is a sort of a fixed thing. The wave is always changing. Like no two waves are alike. Even the wave that you catch there, you have to look over your shoulder while you're paddling for it until the very minute you catch it, because you don't know how it's going to change. And, uh, another thing that makes it hard is that, you know, picture when you're learning something like tennis, you can get one of those machines that will just serve you endless volleys yeah. that's a great way to a great way to learn constant repeated practice it's hard to get constant repeated practice in surfing because number one a lot of days where i live there were no waves at all then if that magic day comes along where there's waves and i don't have to work or i can squeeze it into my schedule then i go out there and i still might only catch five waves in an hour and then i'm exhausted so imagine trying to learn <laughs> imagine trying to learn guitar like your son if you could only strum you know twice a week and then you have yeah. to go back the next week and then strum again. So that, that's, you know, among the things that make surfing dangerous, including the fact that the ocean can be a dangerous place. I myself um, took a rather nasty spill onto the ocean floor, uh, compressed some of my vertebrae. Um, this happened about a, a month before I was supposed to go to a surfing camp in Costa Rica where they were promising these waves larger than I'd ever seen. So that that took a real, you know, that mental thing of, of getting getting past that again as, as a an adult with responsibilities and, you know, a child, you know, why am I doing this? <laughs> Should I be putting my body at risk? And where did you, to... by the way, <laughs> did you get, did you make the Costa Rican surf camp or did you have to wait? I, I did. I got the clearance from my doctor, uh, but it was hard once I got down there. I mean, the first day I showed up, there was someone there from the previous year's camp. And before the camp even began, he said, Hey, do you want to, do you want to go out right now? And I was like, oh, I guess so, but I'm, I'm kind of still very freaked out from this crash. And I went out there and I, I don't even think I caught a wave, but it just felt good to be in the water. And mm -hmm. with the, you know, the, the way I got past that, that fear was to sort of, you know, analyze in retrospect, kind of a deliberate practice thing, what had happened, you know, what, how would I put myself into the condition that led to that? It was, it was an accident, but it was a little bit foreseeable that, you know, there were, there were ways to avoid that happening again. Uh, you know, th that doesn't say there's things that, I don't know, a shark could come along. I can't control that from not happening again. But, um, you know, at some level, you have to just accept, accept accept a certain amount of risk. So I feel like we're going to have thousands of people listening to this, you, you know, the, the spiking of, you know, searching how to juggle, where to go surf. Uh, maybe I've inspired some snowboarders. Uh, maybe we're going to do some singing. But here's the question I have for you is that, where do you, where would you tell our audience, the Retire Sooner audience, to start? I mean, to your point, the list is infinite, pretty much. Um, where do you start? Is it a personality type? Are you athletic? Is it money? What, where would you suggest to go through to um, begin in beginners? Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, I, I would start with a, with a short list of the things that you that really you know top of mind that's that spring to your mind when you ask what would you like to learn to do. Don't you know? Don't worry about what seems you know socially or culturally acceptable or what, what's more prestigious. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just just and, and I wouldn't limit it to one because number one, it's it's if it's fun to learn one thing, it's three times as fun to learn three things. So yeah. it may turn out that you don't like one of the things, and this is what I would say to people: like, don't. Don't think ahead of time that something necessarily is your passion before you've done it. Don't worry about it being a passion because we hear that word a lot, the, the P word. And mm -hmm. you know what can happen is that that if you think that something's a passion, that might actually compel you to work less while doing it. it it's a weird uh, psychological phenomenon that's been identified because you think, wait, oh, tell it's your me passion. About that. Wait, yeah, say that. What do, you, what do you mean by that? That's interesting. Yeah, I mean this kind of kind of comes out of research from Carol. Dweck, who came up with this famous concept of, of mindset, which is, you know, whether, whether, you know, mindset, having the mindset to get good at something versus thinking that you're naturally talented to be good at something. But the, the, the passion works in it's kind of a similar way that if you say, oh, painting is going to be my passion, you know, number one, you might, you might want to just wait, you might want to try painting first, see if you actually like it, because uh, it, it's going to be hard and, and there, there are probably going to be moments where you're not very good at it and you think, well, if it's my passion, how come, how come I'm so bad at it? So I, I, passion is one of those things sort of like goals. I, I would say keep, steer clear of large and overambitious goals. Just keep, keep the goals very simple. I mean, making a little bit of progress or let the learning itself, let the process be the goal, not the progress. Uh, because I, the moment you hit headwinds in any of these things, it's it's going to backfire on you, and you're going to feel discouraged. And but if you if you take it with a spirit of fun, that you know I'm not, it's not your job. You're not doing it for your job. You don't have to get better, but you can just you know sort of see where it takes you. Because that's another thing that we you know didn't necessarily talk about the sense of sort of self expansion you have when you take up a, when you sort of take up a new skill. I mean the pe people. The psychologist named uh, Daniel Gilbert at Harvard has this thing called the end of history illusion. And if you ask people to describe themselves and their tastes, they often, people often think that they're sort of the, the person they're always going to be right at that moment. When, when we know that 10 years ago, they were probably different from they are than they are now. So if you project 10 years in the future, it doesn't, you're probably going to change in ways you don't even, uh, you know, sort of know about yet. So, but skill and skill learning is one of those ways that you can change. And the minute you start to dabble in something like painting or surfing, you know, you're, you're meeting all these different people. You're picking yeah. up these, this, this, the, picking up this new lingo. You're, you're buying new stuff, which is, let's be honest, one of the, one of the most fun parts of uh, learning, <laughs> learning a new skill. Um, and, you know, you're, you're just sort of tapping into something that wasn't there for you before. When, when the Queen's Gambit um, TV show came out, you know, I, I enjoyed it as as just entertainment, but I was also able to really sort of geek out on the chess because I actually understood the chess. Where I, a few years ago, I didn't. It would have just brushed. It would have blown by me. So I, you know, I think it just it just gives you so many more ways to interact with the world and and other people, and and just become, you know, it's sort of like a Swiss Army knife. You're just opening another little whole tool. another blade, whole another yeah. tool, and it's almost like a whole another window, I guess a new core pursuit or hobby takes you and could essentially could, could open up a door to a, a whole new universe is what you're saying. Um, you know, the, which is fascinating and it's so true. It really is true. And I think about, I guess I go back to my snowboard example. It's yeah, it's like a whole new world by, by the way, you're right. Buying snowboard boots this year was like the most fun purchase of the past year. I was like, I'm going to get my own snowboard boots, but it leads to a going on trips to mountains, which I didn't used to do. And people that like to ski and snowboard, which I didn't used to do. So it is like an entirely new, you know, Alice in Wonderland universe that it's a rabbit hole that you had never, I had never gone down. But what about, I guess, this thought of reclaiming an identity, like you go through a tough time, and the thought of using one of these or identifying something that might lift you, really lift you up from a dark place. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one thing I, I really struck me doing this book is some of the people I met. They were all, you know, people were on all sorts of different kinds of journeys. Um, you know, one of my favorite people I met, for example, had had a brain tumor, a, a successful operation, but still, you know, had lost basically the ability to speak. Uh, aphasia, it's called, and he was in, in his hotel, not his hotel room, his hospital room. And a friend of his, uh, he's from the UK. He brought him a, a 
uh, CD by Oasis, his favorite band, started playing the music. This guy, Adrian, started started singing in his bed. He, he couldn't speak, but the music sort of got him to speak. It, it's a long story, but, you know, the music language comes from a different place in the brain than spoken language. So he was able to remember these songs, even though he couldn't speak. So then his therapist says, Wild. Um, his therapist says, maybe you should join a choir that that often helps people regain their ability to speak fluently in, after they've had a stroke or something like a brain tumor. So I met him one one night randomly in my choir, and that was a story. Uh, in surfing, for Whoa. example, I met I met a by woman the way, who did, was. Did, oh, why, yeah. By the way, did he did Adrian? How long did, was he able to learn to speak again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's doing great. He has a he has a foundation. He has a child now, and he's you know uh, knock on wood. He's you know he's he's doing great. Um, and you know and so that was like a that was sort of a medical you know journey. I met other people though you know more life sort of passage things. People you know at surfing camp for example, a woman who has had gone through sort of a really bitter divorce. That you know divorce can be traumatic you know at any stage really. But for her, surfing was this thing. You know it was it was. A new identity. It was something that she didn't have before with her her husband or partner. Um, it, it was also this challenge, uh, an immense physical, you know, uh, uh, emotional challenge in the water. You know, these things, these obstacles you have to overcome. And I think it helps build this resilience that you know, if you can if you can get that stuff, then maybe that will help you, you know, pilot through some of these other, you know, trying experiences. And it, it just you know, and, and it was just more importantly that was just something for herself. She wanted something that, that that marked this new stage in her life and it was just really useful so i found that was a, a common theme you know new beginnings uh, as people were were beginners you know start starting over sometimes sometimes going back to something they had learned a little bit when they were a kid but often it was something completely new tom let's as we wrap up a little bit here i just wanted to ask how maybe take us to a story where maybe maybe the most embarrassing part or the mo the biggest fail at some point or maybe the most inspiring moment in, in this journey of finding these new brand new beginnings well i mean em embarrassing moments that there are many um and this is i, I would say this, this is one of the things about being a beginner is you are going to make a stupid mistake you are going to look like a noob it's just part of it I, I think and i think like going through those things actually is one of the things you'll remember most and it really strengthens you and 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 you builds this self-confidence the fact that you know because you could have someone you know let's say when you start something new like snowboarding you could have someone show you every step of the way perfectly how to do it without you know you can have a coach every moment of your life but at some level you know you, you just have to be out there on your own you're just going to do something wrong you're going to buy the wrong thing you're going to put it on the wrong way you're going to make the wrong move on the mountain i uh have recently started uh, mountain biking, which I haven't really done in my life. I've, I've done cycling, but not mountain biking. And, and they are very different because my daughter was doing it. And I was just going on a trail the other day that is a downhill trail. And I was going uphill and someone came racing around the corner uh, <laughs> and there, there's foliage and just about killed me. And, you know, he, he was told me, told me what he thought of, he gave me his opinion of my mountain biking skill in, in you know, some words we shouldn't use here, but that that's just, that's part of it. Now I, you know, that that moment seared itself on my brain. It was a powerful learning moment because something to finish with here is you know learning actually comes from mistakes. If we if we already knew how to do something, then then it's not learning. You know that that's that's the sort of the the key of learning is, is making that mistake, getting past it, recognizing it in the future, and being able to to move beyond that. So, just... so mountain, so so mountain biking <laughs> for you is next. It sounds like is that is that a new you're yeah, a beginner and, and, in that still. Yeah, and we just uh, really bought a house for the first time, so I, which comes with kind of a lot of uh, land. So there's a lot of a lot of gardening going on, which is sort of an oh, amazing. Cool. Also, that I mean, huge learning curve, a lot of work. It um, but it, it's but it's you know been rewarding during the the pandemic. You know, like a lot, a lot of people are finding out. Um, but yeah, but it, again, I've made mistakes. I've killed plants. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're not going to jail for that. The uh, now, I will ask you though: What about the most inspiring, or the maybe the best, you know, moment of aha or exhilaration of, you know, a brand something brand new? Um, you know, probably probably being on top of. Well, it's funny with with surfing; it's not even like the first 
time I caught a really big wave, it was the first time I just caught any wave. And, and, that, and that's kind of something to, to think about, I think, is that we don't often have to have it. It's not always like that huge goal at way down the road that's going to provide the biggest satisfaction. It's, it's those early moments where you actually just got past that. But um, and then I'll just say one other thing is that, you know, for me, a lot of inspiration came from you know, seeing my daughter win, you know, win these some of these uh, chess tournaments or go on these sort of like um, crazy open water swimming camps and she she won the golden swimming cap at this thing so you know just a, a father's a parent's pride but i felt like you know this experiment i had started was was sort of you know bearing fruit in, in this interesting way and um did she surf yeah. by the way is your has your daughter learned to surf yet she does somewhat not 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 so much lately but she she has done a couple of years of uh, like summer camps and stuff and we, we've gone out together and had some had some great uh experiences and I, it, it's funny here that you know I think people learn differently at different ages. When she was learning some of this stuff initially, she was quite young, and now she's sort of a tween, and she's picking up some of the first <laughs> recognition, in a way, of, of some of the danger involved in some of these things. So she's become a little bit more risk averse with yeah, something like yeah. indoor. Like we see it at the indoor climbing gym, some of these young kids will just like fly up the mountain, fly up the wall. So true. Some of the older kids, like, like, wait a minute, is this? Is this safe? Is this rope been checked by someone? Is this you know they actually start having this uh, frontal cortex or whatever it is? But um, and adults have that big time. <laughs> so uh, again, I would say this: so Tom Vanderbilt, author of Beginners, to me, there is so much. There's so much positivity there, and the concept, which I again, I I've, I started this interview thinking this really is like one of the most genius ideas. It's so simple. But the way you come at this is so helpful, I think, and powerful for particularly for our audience who they're ready to stop working and they need a lot to do. They really do. You know, I've, I've, I've certainly experienced retirees that just don't have a ton going on. And it's, it's a kind of sad. It's actually kind of sad, particularly when you get all the money in the world and nothing to do. It's almost like this terrible, you know, this ironic paradox that you're stuck in and if you're stuck in that because you don't have a million passions and not passions are maybe not even the right word, but a million things you want to go do, I call them core pursuits. I, I think beginners as a book is a one way to kind of get out of any sort of rut that you may be in. So Tom, thank you, my friend, uh, for all of your insight today. And I hope our audience goes out and picks up a copy of beginners. Thank you, Wes. Absolute pleasure. Thanks.